Hey guys, welcome back to a brand new video, and in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the 2022 gubernatorial elections and my predictions for these elections as of today. So before we get into this video, please like this video, subscribe to the channel if you are not subscribed already, please share this video with a friend who you think would enjoy it, and go click all the links in the description. I've got Twitter, Instagram, you can go read my writing. Uh, do all the stuff if you're interested in getting more. If not, though, we're going to get right into the video now. So we're going to start with the safe Democratic states. These are the states that are going to go Democratic essentially no matter what. They're going to go to the party by a margin of more than 15%. And that starts with the state of California. We're going to work our way across the country. So California is number one. Illinois, too, uh, is li likely going to be safe, although it could, again, fall below that 15% margin. But J.B. Pritzker seems to be running a fairly solid campaign. Remember, he did flip the uh, governor's uh, seat here. In 2018, beating out incumbent Republican Bruce Rauner. So he's a good candidate in his own right, and the Republican candidate, Darren Bailey, does not seem to be running a good, uh, very good campaign right now. I also think that when you look at the state as a whole, it's going to stay uh, quite blue for the future, so I don't think it'll be too close. New York as well, the primary turnout there, which again, I think is a bad indicator, but a lot of Republicans have been talking about primary turnout as a good indicator. I think, you know, when you look at it, it was very good for Democrats. Now, either way, I think it's safe. Uh, Maryland and Massachusetts, too. These are actually pickups because the Republicans won both these races in 2018 with incumbent governors Larry Hogan and Charlie Baker. Again, these are moderate to liberal Republicans who ended up either not running for re-election or being term limited. Now the Democrats should pick off these seats fairly easily. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's 11, or, and also Hawaii, too. That's 12 uh, safe seats for the Democrats. For the Republicans, they've got a couple more. Idaho, Wyoming, South Dakota, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama, uh, South Carolina, uh, I think Ohio and Iowa, because the Democrats aren't really going to spend too much time there. Um, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, uh, and Alaska, too, are all pretty solid for the GOP. So they have a lot more safe seats than the Democrats do, um, and they are at 22 seats. So they are only three seats away from having that 25 out of 50, and then four seats away from an outright majority in the NGA. So we're going to have to uh, you know, the Democrats have to do a lot of catching up uh, as we get um, on with the video. So we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to see, can the Democrats do that? So we'll start with the likely Democratic states. That starts with Colorado. Um, I do think that Colorado is a state where the Democrats are going to do very well. Jared Polis in 2018, he held on to the seat for Democrats. Incumbent Democrat Governor John Hickenlooper was term limited. And Jared Polis, as you can see, won by about 10.6%. So he did very well in 2018. The state actually got bluer from 2018 to 2020, believe it or not, despite the fact that 2020 was a more neutral year as 2018 was a blue wave. State's trending blue. I think Jared Polis is going to win by the same amount Joe Biden did in 2020. Um, next up, we have the states of Connecticut and Rhode Island. You see, it's not typically competitive at the federal level, but in 2018, they both were uh, lower than 15% markings for the Democrats in Connecticut. Specifically, it was actually quite close. Ned Lamont was up. Uh, he only won the race by about 3%. In Rhode Island, Gina Raimondo, who is you know now no longer the governor, it's like the Democratic nominee will likely be Dan McKee. Uh, only be Allen Fung by about fifteen points. And that was in a blue wave, and you know Fung is a good candidate, but the Republicans I think are going to put a put up even better fight this year. So I think Connecticut's going to be, but a you know seven or eight point margin for the Democrats, or probably ten or eleven point margin for the Democrats. So that's it for the likely Democratic states. Now, for the likely Republican states, they've got quite a few. So the first is the state of Kansas, where this is the third flip of the night. Obviously, Democrats flip in Maryland and Massachusetts. The Republicans are going to flip Kansas. This is a you know, pr fairly easy call for me to make because, despite the fact that Democrats did win the seat in 2018, it was under a special set of circumstances that is not going to be replicated again. So first of all, Chris Cope. So heading into this election... The Republicans held the governor's mansion. It was Sam Brown back, and he was a very unpopular governor. Even in 2014, which was a red wave year, he only won re-election by 2% in a state like Kansas. So he was not a popular governor. No one really liked Sam Brown back, including most Republicans too. And he ultimately, you know, hurt Republicans down ballot in Kansas in the, you know, as, as he was leaving office. And so Chris Kobach was already a very divisive figure, not very, um, you know, not very... Uh, a you know not not a very good candidate for the GOP in terms of electability. He was a you know he came into this spot and he lost to Laura Kelly, who was a better candidate for the Democrats. She ran a good campaign. She appealed to a lot of moderate Republicans and was able to pick off the state. And so I think uh, Kelly, you know, and the fact that it was a blue wave at her back really helped her too. And so now she's running against Derek Schmidt, who's the Attorney General. He's you know not not as bad of a politician as Chris Kobach is. 
Sam Brownback obviously is now kind of a distant memory for a lot of Kansans. And so I think that uh, the Republicans are going to pick off Kansas, flip it back to their column. Laura Kelly's not super unpopular, but I don't think that she gives enough Republicans reason to vote for her and cross over and vote for her one more time. So I've got her losing by about 12 points. I think it could be a little more, but again, uh, it's just a really red state and a really Republican year, and it's not voting well for Laura Kelly. Uh, Texas, too. I think Texas is going to be very solid for the Republicans. In twenty, uh, So Texas, you know, Beto works the Democratic candidate in the 2018 Senate race. He did very well. He only lost to Ted Cruz by about 2%. But in the governor race, Greg Abbott, who he's trying to beat, also did very well. He beat Lupe Valdez by about 13%. And I think that's kind of the margin I'm expecting for this race. Uh, Beto will probably do a little better in the suburbs, specifically Tarrant County, which was the county that uh, Joe Biden won, the Greg Abbott won by 11 points. I think he will um, not really win it, but I think he'll come within five here. And I think he's also going to do a lot better in Colin and Denton, crack 40, which uh, Lupe Valdez did not do. And, uh, you know, I, I think he'll also do better in, you know, Williamson and uh, uh, Kamal, Kamal County. And, you know, these are just areas that I think are, are, are more likely to be um, – to be democratic trending and overall will do better there but i think he'll do a little worse in the or actually not a little worse he'll do substantially worse in the rio grande valley you know i'd, I'd be interested to see if he can match biden's performance there because biden did poorly but the air is trending red so we'll have to see but i think beto uh is kind of the sacrificial lamb for the texas democrat for this year florida that's ron DeSantis. he's going to be fine he won narrowly in 2018 although again that was a blue wave year he was not as popular back then as he is now uh you know Andrew Gillum wasn't a great opponent, but Charlie Crist, who will likely be the Democratic challenger, isn't fantastic either. I think he's a fine candidate, but I don't think he'll really energize the base too much, and I don't think they'll come out in a state like Florida, which is, you know, getting redder pretty significantly. And I think that uh, ultimately this race will go to Ron DeSantis. So those are the three likely states. Puts the Republicans at 25 seats. They only have to win one more to get an an outright majority in the NGA. So lean Democratic states, starting with Oregon. I think Oregon is, is going to be you know, quite competitive. The interesting thing here is that there's an independent in the race, Betsy Johnson, who uh, could take away votes from both parties, but if she does take her one party more, it's probably the Democrats. You know, she was a former Democrat in the state legislature. Um, she will probably do best in the Portland suburbs, which are a more Democratic area. And I do think that the race will narrow up a bit. Uh, that being said, um, you know, Christine Drazen, who is the Republican candidate, I, I don't think is that great of a politician. You know, she's a fine candidate. She, she's not bad, but I don't think she's going to do enough to win over a state like Oregon. And Kate Brown's kind of like this, you know, not she's not as unpopular as Sam Brownback was by any stretch, but she wasn't popular. And in 2018, in a blue wave, she only won re-election by about, I think, 7%. So she was not you know, super well-liked well, well in Oregon. And I think that Oregon likes their contested gubernatorial elections, but at the end of the day, I do see the Democrats pulling it off here. And I really do think that... Uh, um, Tina Kotek is going to be the next governor of Oregon, although, again, it will be by a reduced margin. Next up is the state of Minnesota, where I'm actually moving it down from lean to uh, from likely to lean. Um, I could easily see it being likely, but, I'm, you know, actually, mm, I think I'll put it as likely because I don't really want to, because I think lean's like officially competitive. But, um, yeah, Tim Wall is running for re-election here. He won by over, I think, 11 points in 2018. He did very well in the rural areas. He actually won all of the Iron Range. He even won Carleton County, which was a county that I believe Joe Biden actually lost or narrowly won in 2020. He won a lot of these counties that Biden ended up narrowly losing, and he got to a good turnout. He did very well in the Minneapolis suburbs. He even won Anoka County, which was a county that typically was more Republican at the time. So I do think that he's a good candidate. I think he'll win re-election by probably five or six percent. But yeah, not too much to say here. Ryan, you know, uh, I think is it, is it Brian Jensen? I don't even know. But Jensen is a Republican candidate. He's a fine candidate, but I don't think he's good enough to win in a uh, state like Minnesota, which is, you know, pretty Democratic even in red wave years. And I think the, Dem- the Minnesota Republicans will be more focused on beating Keith Ellison, who's actually in a, a very competitive race for attorney general there. So, yeah, I right now, um, I really do think Minnesota is going to go with the Democrats by a little more than 5%. Um, next up for early Democratic states, that would be the state of Michigan. And Michigan is, you know, a state usually very competitive in midterms. But this year, I think the Democrats will win, although not by, you know, not by attempt. I think the, Dem- the Democrats are going to do pretty well here. In 2018, Gretchen Whitmer, obviously running for her first term in office, she won, uh, a, you know, by quite a substantial margin against Bill Schwett. And I really do think, uh, ultimately, that she is going to get reelected this year. Now, we don't know who the Republicans will be running. It's going to be either one of Tudor Dixon, Ryan Kelly, or Kevin Rinke. And, um, you know, I think I think Rinke was the one who, who, who referred to his own um, 
genitalia is gold, so he is not a great candidate. Kira Dixon, I think, is like the best candidate of the field, but that's not saying why she's still a below average candidate. And Ryan Kelly was actually arrested for his role, I think, on January 6th. So not a great field of Republicans here. I I, I really don't think that they're going to be in for a good night in Michigan with all these House races, too, because I, spoiler alert, I do have the Democrats winning um, a few competitive House races here as well, and I think they're going to hold on to the AG and SOS races. So I think the Michigan Republicans are kind of in for a bad year, despite the, or a bad election, despite the fact that I think the Republicans will be doing well elsewhere. You know, Gretchen Wimmer, she's a good incumbent. Um, I just think the Republicans aren't up to the challenge to beat her out this time. Uh, next up is Maine. Um, I think Maine's a state that, you know, could have been considered a toss-up prior to the Dobbs ruling, but um, I am going to label it as um, as lean Democratic still. Um, I think that the Dobbs ruling helps Democrats here because I think, you know, Maine's a very pro-choice state, and there were a lot of pro-choice voters who voted for Susan Collins last year or last time, and uh, now I think the energy is more in Democrats' favor. Paul LePage is a good candidate. I think he really gives the Republicans a good chance here, but Ultimately, I, I don't know if, if his campaign is gaining the traction that is that, that it what would be needed to gain to win a blue state like Maine. So uh, not out of the question for Republicans, but I do think that uh, things are going to be pretty tough uh, for them to win this election as of where it stands now. Uh, for a lean Republican states, I have two of these states, and these are going to give the majority. The first is Wisconsin. I do think that Wisconsin is going to be quite good for the GOP in uh, November. Tony Evers is, you know, he's the incumbent Democrat, and in 2018, he beat out Scott Walker by about a point. And um, this wasn't a great performance, to be honest with you. I think Scott Walker had a lot of beef with uh, working class voters who came out for Tony Evers, but uh, Evers really should have won by more. It was a blue wave. He had a lot of, he had uh, uh, Tammy Baldwin uh, as the, you know, she was a Democrat who was running for Senate and she, she won her Senate seat by like 11 points here. So I, I think his 2018 performance is kind of overrated. He didn't really do that well. He should have won by a bit more. Against an incumbent like Scott Walker, who was so polarizing and didn't really have a ton of crossover appeal. And he only won by a bit of points. So I don't think t- Tony Evers is in a good spot right now. He's, he hasn't really pivoted to the center to try to appeal to Republicans. Because again, the thing with Wisconsin is that Joe Biden might have won it, but the electorate that shows up in November will likely be a bit more Republican leaning. And so uh, Tony Evers needs to make some you know crossover appeal to these Republicans. I don't think he's able to do that. And uh, Cleefish and Michaels are in a tough primary, but I think Cleefish can nearly get the nomination. Anyways, uh, point being, I think both of them would beat uh, Tony Evers by a pretty similar margin. I, I, I just Tony Evers has to run a really thin, you know, he has to really run the table in a lot of places in Wisconsin. I don't think he can do that. So um, I've got the race as a lean Republican race. And until, you know, there's been some good polling for Tony Evers, but again, we know how polling in Wisconsin works. We know it's good for, for Democrats, even though it's usually, uh, it ends up being wrong. So uh, I think Tony Evers is going to lose re-election this year, being the first Rust Belter to go down. Um, next up is Georgia. Georgia's a race that I think a lot of people have been very like bullish on the Republicans, and yeah, I think they're you know definitely favored here. Anyone saying Stacey Abrams is favored where we stand right now, I think, is kind of um, misconstruing what's going on here to you. And the thing we're seeing is that Raw Hill Warnock leads in most polls, or the most recent polls, but the issue is that Democrats in um, in Georgia are like, you know, the, the the thing is a lot of people are voting for Warnock but aren't really backing Abrams and she's running behind him in every poll. And so if Warnock only wins by a point, it won't be enough to drag her over the line. And I agree. I think Warnock can win by just under a point. I think Abrams is going to lose by, you know, 4 or 5%. I don't think it'll be that good of a performance for her. I think uh, she'll really run behind him in the Atlanta suburbs most of all. Although she will have good black turnout. I think her and Warnock are a good ticket for black turnout for Democrats. But at the end of the day, ultimately, I do think that the GOP in Nevada are, are going to be having a bit of a tougher time trying to get, um, you know, trying to get Ill, uh, these, or, you know, or sorry, the Democrats in Georgia are going to have a tougher time trying to get uh, suburban voters to come over for Abrams when Kemp is so popular. So um, I really do think Georgia's going to stay red, although again, it could change because I think, Ab- you know, People are, I think, unnecessarily bearish on Abrams, and I st- still think she has a solid chance of winning this race, although right now uh, it's, it's it's not looking too good for her. Um, next up is uh, our, actually, for our tilt Democratic states. You know, these are the true toss-ups here, these three Sunbelt states in Pennsylvania. I think I'll do these in geographical order. So Pennsylvania, I'm going to give to the Democrats. It's 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 very close right now. Really, it is. But um, I think Josh Shapiro is the narrow favorite as of where we stand right now. Um, he is out like Josh Shapiro has like, I think $30 million on hand and Doug Mastrano has 500,000. Like 
it's just not even a you know a fundraising contest right now. Like Shapiro hasn't even like begun the ad blitz. He has like kind of like a Death Star of money to unload against Doug Mastriano, and he has will have the entire Democratic Party uh, at his back trying to you know, give him that victory over Mastriano, who's viewed as a very extreme candidate by a lot of Democrats and independents, and even some Republicans do. And you know, on that topic, some Republicans eventually formed a pack against Mastriano to try to get him to lose to Shapiro, even though they were Republicans. So. You know, uh, I think the fact that the, the RGA don't really want to invest in this race to help Josh Shapiro and the fact that the there are a lot of Republicans who are skeptical about him really does – or Mastriano, good God, I can't talk. They're, sorry, the RGA aren't really going to go all in in this race. It doesn't seem like they are because they, they think that they think that Josh Shapiro, that Josh Shapiro is kind of going to win this race no matter what and they don't want to waste their money there. They want to focus on other races. And, you know, when you look at – Pennsylvania, I just think that the Republicans aren't really fully in support of Mastriano, and that kind of hurts him a lot. And I think he'll get hammered for a lot of his more extreme stances on issues like abortion in the 2020 election, and I think that'll hurt him in the suburbs. Well, he will do very well in rural areas, so he has a good chance, but again, I think Shapiro's the narrow favorite as of right now. Now, next up for the Democrats, or I guess for the Republicans actually, is New Mexico. And this is a flip. Last time I had it as lean Democratic, but I'm going to give it to the Republicans here. I'm a, I'm like this might be surprising, but you'll know it's coming if you read my piece, my most recent one from last week about Ron Chetty's path to victory over Michelle Lujan Grisham. I think he has a, you know, I, I looked at it and I really, you know, was thinking, wow, Ron Chetty has a better path than I originally thought. Oh, yes, you know, because again, I think a lot of Democratic Hispanics in the central part of the state are going to, you know, especially in the city of Albuquerque, are going to be uh, seeing a little bit less for now. A Democratic, I, I think Native voters are going to be solid for Democrats, but. The issue is that I think in a lot of these areas, um, the Democrats are going to be, I think, dealing with turnout problems, and Ron Chetty will have a lot of suburban voters coming to his side because of MLG's recent scandal. So I do think that MLG is in a very tough spot here, and I, you know, it's, it's a toss-up race, but I think she's narrowly favored to lose. Arizona's another toss-up race. It's another race I have the GOP winning. Um, yeah, I like... Like I said, I I really do think that um, it doesn't really matter who the GOP run between Carrie Lake or Karen Taylor ropes. And I think Lake is still a narrow favor to get the nomination. But um, again, we don't know that yet. We'll have to wait until the primary happens. But I think Karen Taylor ropes will win by maybe 3%, Lake win by but 2%. I don't really think it matters, to be honest with you. Uh, the fact of the matter is that I think Arizona is a state that is very like generically Republican. They only vote for like my theory with Arizona is that the, is that for now it'll trend blue in the future, but for now they only vote for Democrats if they're like given like a really good reason to. And generic Republicans like Doug Ducey or even Trump in twenty sixteen were able to win the state in twenty twenty. Whereas in twenty twenty, it took a lot for Biden. Like it, Biden was supposed to win Arizona by a lot more than he actually did, and ultimately I think that came down to Trump doing better than he expected with Hispanics and um, turnout in the cities of Tucson and Phoenix themselves being a little worse for Biden than anticipated. I think when you look at these cities in the midterms, they're going to have a drop in Democratic turnout. Republican turnout will be up. Suburbanites are going to come home for the Republicans ultimately, even if they don't love Carrie Lake. I think that'll be enough to hold the seat for Republicans, although, again, it is going to be quite close. Um, Nevada is the final state. I'm going to give it to the Democrats here. This is, I think, the closest race on the board right now. That or uh, Pen- I think that or New Mexico are going to be the closest, be the closest race. But um, – uh, Nevada it, it itself is very inelastic. It does not like it hasn't moved in really six years. It was Clinton plus two point four. The, the Democrats did immediately win the governor race by four percent in twenty eighteen. So good for Steve Sisolak, I guess. But in twenty twenty, and in the twenty sixteen Senate race, Cortez Masto as well. But in twenty twenty, uh, it reverted back to a D plus two point four margin, despite the fact Democrats didn't really campaign here. Their turnout operation in Las Vegas was hampered by COVID, and I do think ultimately that the Democrats have a little bit more room to grow in Nevada that people give them credit for. I think long-term it could get concerning, but ultimately I do expect the Democratic Party to have a uh, decent time in Nevada. I think Joe Lombardo is a really good candidate for the Republicans. Don't get me wrong. I probably have it as Lee and D if they're running like Dean Heller or Joey Gilbert or whatnot, but Lombardo is a good candidate. He's you know the sheriff of Las Vegas. Um, I do think that he'll do quite well with, um, you know, I, I, I mean – I don't really know because the thing is, this is a good incumbent too, so that could be canceled out. But uh, ultimately, I think that, you know, when you look at Cortez Masso's coalition, I think she's going to turn out a lot more Hispanics that, that that would not turn out in a midterm, generally speaking, even more so than Jackie Rosen or the, uh, than uh, Steve Sisolak in 2018 did. And they still won these races. So 
Um, I think that the Democrats are going to have a t- turnout problem maybe in Arizona or New Mexico or Texas or maybe even Florida, but I don't think that'll be the case in a state like Nevada. So Nevada, I narrowly, narrowly give to Steve Sislak just because he's the incumbent because I don't think he's unpopular enough to lose in a swing state. But again, Joe Lombardo is really going to give him a run for his money. I think he's a good candidate and I think he can ultimately win this race. So um, uh, that's it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. I, I, I hope you agree with my predictions. If you disagree, again, there are a lot of close races, so I don't blame you if we disagree on a race or two. But comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on these races because I think they're really interesting. I think we still have a long way to go till November, but these are what my thoughts are as of right now. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. If you did, leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye, guys.